So we're looking at the last concept in this course, which are antiderivatives. And another word for that is integration. In front of us, we have the definition that says, if we have a function, capital F is an antiderivative of little f um, on an interval i, if f prime of x is equal to little f of x for all x on in i, we denote the capital letter of f of x as the antiderivative. So let me give you notation wise on how we're going to write antiderivatives. And then let me show you formulas on how we can get the antiderivatives of each function. So we are going to have a notation for antiderivatives. And so let me read through this. So given a function, little f of x, we say that this is an antiderivative of f of x is any function capital F of x such that if we took that derivative of the antiderivative, it undoes itself and it gives us back our original function f of x. So if capital F of x is an antiderivative of f of x, then most general antiderivatives of f of x is called the indefinite integral and is denoted by so notice we'll have this kind of elongated S shape that is called the integral symbol. We're looking at inside of that integration is our f of x. We call what we're taking the integral of, the integrand. Notice that our function in here is in terms of x. So x is called the integration variable. And C is called the constant of integration. So when we take the antiderivative of little f of x, we get that capital F of x plus C, where C is some arbitrary constant. So I am, let's look at back over here. So if we had, for example, the integral of 2x dx. So we're trying to go backwards. We're trying to think about, okay, what could I take um, the derivative of to get back 2x? Well, there's multiple things that we can take, actually an infinite number of things that we could take the derivative of and get back 2x. So I know that if I had x squared and I took the derivative of that, I would get back 2x. But any constant I add on here would also give me back 2x when I took the derivative. And so the antiderivative here of 2x dx, we can write as capital F of x, is equal to x squared plus c. So we can always go back and we can check this by looking and showing that if we took the derivative of this antiderivative, we're gonna get back 2x. And so going back, if I took the derivative of x squared, I know I get 2x, and we know that the derivative of a constant is also 2x. And so we found that the antiderivative of 2x is x squared. So you're kind of going backwards. So for instance, if we had the integral of e to the x dx, it's trying to think to yourself, what can I take the integral or differentiate to get back that integral or integrand of e to the x? Well, I know if I take the derivative of e to the x, I get back e to the x. So the derivative of the antiderivative e to the x is e to the x, but we are going to have to add on this plus c. So what about what could we take the antiderivative of? if we had three e to the three x. 
So I'm trying to think to myself, what am I, can I take the derivative of that? I get three e to the three x back. Well, rules of derivatives for our exponential e, we take the derivative of our exponent, which would have been three, times the original e itself, e to the three x. So the antiderivative of this three e to the three x dx is gonna be e three to the x plus c. So we can do this with you know, a lot of different things. So what could we take the derivative of to get just back cosine of x? Well, we know that the derivative of sine x gives me cosine of x. So the antiderivative of cosine of x would have to be sine x. And then we have to add on that constant c. So recall when we were taking derivatives, we were finding the rate of change. And so for instance, if you had some function, let's just do a f of x like this. It doesn't matter wherever we take the derivative, if this derivative here is gonna be the same thing as if I took the derivative, same function, but I shifted it up. So if this was a plus c here, I would have this function in here. So it has the same rate of change and it doesn't look like the same function, but it is, it's just the same function. Or if I decreased and I shifted it down. So the rate of change is gonna be the same each, each place. make them look the same. So if I was trying to find the derivative at some value, and I found the equation, the slope of the tangent line, let's say at this point right here is this, well, if I shifted that down, it's still gonna be that same rate of change for each value if my graph was correct. Okay, so there is a formula that we can use to help us find derivatives. So if you had the antiderivative of x raised to the nth power dx, what we're doing is we're gonna add one to our exponent. and we're gonna divide by our new exponent of n plus one. And then we're gonna add some constant c. So let's show we got that capital F of x here was equal to x raised to the n plus one all over n plus one plus c. And if we took the derivative of that, We bring our power down front, n plus one. Parentheses around it. We subtracted one from that exp exponent of n plus one. This was all over n plus one. And the derivative of our constant c was zero. So the derivative of prime of x, notice that we have this n plus one in the numerator and n plus one in the denominator. Those are gonna cancel out. And then we have here, this is equal to x raised to the nth power, which we showed was our integrand of our integral, x to the nth dx. Okay, so here, that's our main rule. If you have x raised to some power. Okay, so let's use that rule. Let's say you had had
the integral of 5x cubed dx. So by this rule, this 5, which I'll show you the rule in a second, this 5 can actually be pulled outside of our inner ground if we would like, just like when we were taking derivatives, if we had a coefficient in front of the term that we were taking the derivative of, we could pull that out, take the derivative of the variable, and then multiply by the coefficient. And so this is going to be 5, add 1 to our exponent, and then we're dividing by our new exponent. So this is going to give us 5x to the 4th divided by 4 plus c. So if we go backwards and we took the derivative, we can see that we would get back 5x cubed. So this piece right here is just checking to show that we did um, everything right. So the derivative of the antiderivative should undo itself. We can pull that 5 fourths out, bring our exponent down a fourth, subtract 1 from our exponent, which is going to give us a 3. Derivative of a constant is 0. Simplify the 4's cancel, and we're left with 5x cubed. So we did the things correctly. So there's rules in here, just like when we were taking limits and when we were taking derivatives. Um, if you had a sum, we could break it down as taking the, the derivative of each piece in our sum. So if you had the antiderivative, let's say, of f of x plus or minus g of x, Uh, let me put brackets around that whole thing, dx. This is the same thing as if we took the antiderivative of f of x plus or minus dx. I need to put the dx in there. Plus or minus the antiderivative of g of x, dx. Same thing as I just mentioned was that if you have a constant c times f of x gx, we can rewrite this as c times the integral of f of x dx. Okay, so we saw in the past that that was not always the case when we had derivatives of a product, we couldn't just take the product, a derivative of the first times the derivative of the second. Same thing, we found out with the derivative of quotient, we couldn't just do that. There were rules. And same sort of idea for antiderivatives. Integration, we can't just break down products or quotients, but we could break down the sum or difference of two functions. So in front of us, we have the rules. Um, given the function, finding the antiderivative. So we just talked about this one right here. If you had the, taking the antiderivative of x to the n, you're going to add 1 to your exponent, divide by your new exponent of n plus 1, which is the same thing as multiplying by 1 over n plus 1, plus our constant c. There is one stipulation that I didn't mention, is that n can't be negative 1. So if you remember, recall that when we took the derivative of this certain function, we got back 1 over x. Or this is the same thing as x raised to the negative 1 power. And this is why n can't be negative 1. So recall the derivative of our natural log of x. And then I'm going to have to have this c plus c. So if I took the derivative of the natural log of x, that's 1 over x. Derivative of the constant is 0. And that is right here. 
So if x is neg or if n is negative one, we have one over x. And the antiderivative is the natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. Um, rules of logs, x can't be zero, and you can't take the natural log of a negative number. And so that's where they have those absolute values there. These other ones that you see in here, we'll look more at um, when we look at doing substitution when we're taking antiderivatives. But here's the, the general rules of these. So looking at the example in front of our, us, we're looking at the integral of 3t squared plus t divided by 2 dt. So we're taking the integral of this with respect to t. We can use our rules. Normally, I wouldn't do this, but our rules said that we could break this down as taking the integral of each piece of our sum. We can pull that coefficient out front of our integral. So three times the integral of three, I'm sorry, t squared dt plus I can pull this out. So this over two, think of this as one half times t. So one half the integral of t dt. So our rule says we're going to add one to our exponent. So if I do two plus one, our new exponent that we have is three. We're dividing by our new exponent plus this one half out front, taking the antiderivative of t, we're adding one to our exponent, and we're dividing by our new exponent, when this case is two. And then we're adding some constant c. I can simplify this. Notice our threes cancel, and I'm left with t cubed plus well, one half times this one half in here. So really we're over four t squared in the numerator plus c. So we have the antiderivative. This is t cubed plus t squared divided by four plus c. So the next example we have in front of us is the integral of four plus the square root of t that's all in the numerator, and that's all divided by t cubed dt. So how it's written right now, I don't know how to take the antiderivative. Recall when we first learned how to take derivatives, we had to sometimes rewrite things in a form so that we could take the derivative. Same sort of idea here with antiderivatives until we learn some, some more rules that might help us. But for now, we don't know how to take the antiderivative of this. But I noticed that I could break this down into two separate fractions. I could rewrite this as 4 over t cubed plus the square root of t over t cubed dt. So let's go back and let's do some work on the side. That square root of t, let's rewrite that using, get rid of the radical and rewrite it in exponential form. So square root of t is the same thing as t raised to the one half power. And then I want to use my rules of exponents. So recall if you have division, same base, that we could subtract the exponent. So b to the n power over b to the m power is equal to b to the n minus m exponent. So let's rewrite this. And then also, I can't, I don't know how to think the antiderivative 4 over t cubed, but if I bring that, that exponent or that um, term up into the numerator, then it would be in that form that I could do that. And so there's another rule of exponents that we could do that. If you had 1 over b to the nth power, we can rewrite that as b to the negative n power. So let's go back and rewrite our integrand. So this is the same thing as 4t to the negative third power plus t 
t, well, this is the one half power minus the power on the bottom, which is three dt. So the integral of four t to the negative third power plus t, getting a common denominator so I can rewrite my exponent as a single fraction. So that would be two. So one half minus six halves is negative five halves dt. So now it's in the form that we can go find the antiderivative. So going through here, we're going to add one to our exponent. And we divide by our new exponent. So negative 3 plus 1, that's going to give me negative 2 as our new exponent. Plus, we're going to add 1 to our exponent of negative 5 halves. So that 1 I'm going to write as 2 halves. And we're going to divide by our new exponent. So negative 5 halves plus 2 halves is negative 3 halves and then plus c. So simplifying this down, I notice this 2 here can go into 4 twice. So I am technically have, because of the negative, negative 2t. Well, negative 3 plus 1, that's a negative 2. Because I'm dividing by a fraction, I can invert multiply by the reciprocal of that fraction. So I'm really multiplying by negative 2 thirds t to the negative 3 halves plus c. So let's just rewrite these so that has a positive exponent. So this is negative 2 all over t squared minus two thirds, um, and that three we can rewrite as times t to the three halves power plus c. So if we took the derivative of this, we should be able to get back this integrand here. So the next example says solve the initial value problem dy dx is 2x minus 7 and y sub 2 is 0. So we're given the rate of change and we want to find the original problem. So we know that the original problem y is going to equal the antiderivative of 2x minus 7 dx. So we can break this down. Let's just take the antiderivative of each piece. So taking the antiderivative of 2x, adding 1 to our exponent. So 1 plus 1 gives me 2. Divide by our new exponent of 2. Minus antiderivative of 7. Well, antiderivative of a constant is that constant times x, so negative 7x. And then we have this plus c. So y, in this case, is equal to x squared minus 7x plus c. So this initial value problem gives me enough information so I know what c is. It tells me that when x is 2, my y value I get back is 0. So let's go back in here. Let's plug in 2 for x. So I have 2 squared minus 7 times 2 plus c. I know that this is equal to 0. So here we get 0 is equal to 4 minus 14 plus c. So I get 0 is equal to negative 10 plus c. So c is equal to 10.
So really, what we really wanted to find was what is our original function of y? So our y value is x squared minus 7x plus 10. So another initial value problem, we're given the third derivative of y is equal to six. We're given the second derivative evaluated at zero is negative eight. The first derivative evaluated is zero is zero and y sub zero is five. So we're given the third derivative. So basically we wanna take the antiderivative three times to get the original function. So if we took, I you know, y prime of double prime of x, I can get <laughs> by taking the antiderivative of 6 dx. Well, antiderivative of 6 is 6x plus c. But I can figure out what c is because I know when x is 0, my y value here is negative 8. So negative 8 is equal to 6 times 0 plus c. So c here is negative 8. So my double prime of x is really 6x minus 8. I can find my first derivative of x by undoing my second derivative by taking the antiderivative of the second derivative. So y prime of x, so the antiderivative of 6x, add one to my exponent which would give me two, divide by my new exponent, two, minus antiderivative of a constant is that constant times x plus our c. So this time we're given when x is zero, y is zero. So let's go in here and plug in zero for x and zero for y. So I get zero is equal to, well, six times zero squared over two is zero minus zero plus C. So in this case, our C value is zero. And so my first derivative function was, and let's just simplify this when we rewrite it, two goes into six three times. So three X squared minus eight X. So one more time, and we can find out what the initial function was. And so I know if I want to find y of x, I can take the antiderivative of the derivative, 3x squared minus 8x, dx. So adding one to my exponent, so I have three X, now it's a cubed, divide by my new exponent cubed, minus eight X, add one to my exponents, now two, divide by the new exponent two plus C. We're given that when X is zero, when X is zero, my Y value is five. So let's solve for x here. So 5 is equal to 3 times 0 cubed divided by 3 minus 8 times 0 squared divided by 2, which things cancel, plus c. So yeah, that c is equal to 5. And my original function, y of x, is going to be now x cubed, simplifying, minus 4x squared 
plus five. So it's going backwards. 